On July 4th, 1945, the war was lost. In an instant, a flash of light over Hawaii destroyed Pearl Harbor. The very next day, the president announced that the United States would be seeking a conditional surrender with Japan and Germany, ending the Second World War. What would happen if the Axis won World War II? Said scenario has been explored in shows, books, first-person shooters, etc. So let's talk about an incredibly niche mod for the strategy game Hearts of Iron 4 that does this. The New Order, The Last Days of Europe, makes two main points of divergence from our timeline. First, Herbert Hoover gets a second term in office, allowing him to keep doing absolutely nothing about the Great Depression and Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., who succeeds him in 1936, while wanting to begin an economic stimulus, gets stonewalled by both Congress and the Supreme Court. So he can't do much about it, really. So when the war started, America didn't have near the caliber of production ability that it had in our timeline to match the Japanese. Secondly, in Europe, Bukharin, not Stalin, had succeeded Lenin. But Bukharin differs greatly from Stalin, as that he continues with Lenin's new economic plan, or NEP, which is basically a system of more or less state capitalism. This fails spectacularly, ending in famine and widespread revolts. The Soviet Union is only really able to start industrializing in the late 1930s, which was too little too late. When Germany invaded in 1941, the war only took six months before the Soviets collapsed. The Italians are also magically competent in this timeline and are able to blitz to the Suez Canal, and with help from German Fallschirmjägers, take Gibraltar, trapping the British Navy in the Mediterranean. Because German technology is apparently the best in the world, Germany also gains air superiority in Britain, allowing for a successful Operation Sea Lion, which eventually sees the capitulation of the British and the end of the war in Europe. There still was hope in the Pacific, as by 1945, America was finally beginning to gain the upper hand on the Japanese. But a German plane taking off from a Japanese carrier drops a nuclear warhead right over Pearl Harbor, dashing any of America's remaining willpower to continue the war. So now the war is over, and Hitler, high on victory, and meth, is free to set off on all his ambitious projects. Germany rebuilds Berlin as Germania, and starts an endless carpet bombing campaign in both Africa and Russia. But their biggest goal is to dam the Mediterranean to create a new landmass called Atlantropa. After the Gibraltar Dam is built, and a good portion of the Mediterranean is dried up, it is revealed that seabed is in fact not fertile farmland suited for Aryan settlers. And instead, it just creates inhospitable salted desert. Oops, not like scientists could have predicted that one. Sure, this current economic boom needed to sustain these projects has been fueled by the ever-growing expansion of the war industry and looting of conquered territory, but it's not like that's going to end, right? Well, in 1950, things come crashing down, when the German economy finally collapses under its own weight, beginning a decade of chaos which led to separate camps in the Reich forming on the lines of how to solve the crisis. Albert Speer and his reformists want to reform the Reich and liberalize. Himmler and the SS believe the opposite, in that National Socialism has not gone far enough. Goring and his militants recognize the root cause was that the economy was just fueled by conquest, and that the Reich just needed to start conquering again to fix the economy, because that is a great long-term solution. Warbin's conservatives just stated that some minimal reforms were needed. Meanwhile, in Russia, several of the most powerful warlord states, seeing the poor state Germany was in, decided to join together and form the West Russian Revolutionary Front, and attack the Germans along the Archangel Astrakhan line. Now with Germania in chaos, seeing this as his chance, Heinrich Himmler begins to mass the SS for a coup, only for Hans Speidel to get wind of this and disperse the SS in Germania. Still though, while Hitler would like to have started a purge that would have made the Knight of Long Knives look soft, the hair was busy in Russia, and Hitler could not risk starting a civil war. So he offers them a deal. Himmler can have Belgium and Northern France as his own little personal fiefdom, as long as he promises not to interfere again with the Reich. Speidel, after this, was able to rally the Wehrmacht and eventually defeat the Russians. After the war, which would be known as the West Russian War, the economy stabilized somewhat, fueled by massive amounts of slavery, which is very sustainable and will never lead to any future slave revolts. But hey, at least in 1962, Germany lands a guy on the moon, which is good for them, I guess. <laughs> So yeah, the giant dam that Germany built turned out to be a terrible idea. With port facilities cut off from the sea and needing to be relocated to the new coastline, the economies of the Mediterranean took massive blows. There's also the problem of now exposed seabed being non-arable and basically creating a giant desert. Whatever goodwill was left between Germany and Italy evaporated, just like the Mediterranean, with Italy creating the triumvirate with the newly formed Iberian Union and Turkey as a way of surviving the fallout. As the final middle finger to Germany, Mussolini even repealed the 1938 racial laws and even went as far as to welcome tens of thousands of Jewish refugees into the newly established Governataro del Levante, supporting a policy of Zionism there. Yeah. 
the Kingdom of England is something of a black sheep among the countries of the German Unity Pact. Due to its status as a former world power, the kingdom did not become a fully integrated Reichskommissstadt. Instead, it maintained a democratically elected government based on the pre-war system, with the only substantial difference in the fact that the government was completely chosen by King Edward, who pinky swear to the Germans to not oppose them in any way. Though the Reich does directly control the Cornwall region, where a large garrison is placed just in case the Brits get any ideas. Though cracks are beginning to form in that structure. With the populace realizing the decrepit state of the Reich, resistance activities have intensified, not to mention non-collaborationists have even begun to make their way into the government. There's also the matter of Scotland and Wales, who were able to seize their independence after the war, though for now they try to stay neutral. And in Ireland, well come on, it's Ireland, so terrorism happens of course. So, you thought regular Nazism is bad? Well now, we have an entire nation run by the SS, who thought Hitler was soft. Life in Burgundy is basically pure hell. Think Orwell's 1984, blended with esoteric Nazism. Yet, also contradicted in its quest for racial purity, as the regime must lean on volunteer Belgian and French SS regiments to prop it up. One of Hitler's motives for giving Himmler Burgundy was so he would have all his resources tied down subduing the territory, so he would not be a threat. Well, that doesn't totally work, and Himmler pursues his global plans, which are basically covert operation designed to bring about global instability, with the end goal of causing a nuclear war where everyone but pure Aryans would be wiped out. Russia speed round. So as we know, Western Russia is annexed by the Reich and is split into several Reich Reichskommissats. But what about the rest? Well, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, everything the Germans did not annex fell into a bunch of warlord states. There are some really wacky ones like the Aryan Brotherhood, who think Slavs can become Aryans. Or then there's the Siberian Black League, who basically want Holocaust 2 electric boogaloo, just where instead it's them killing the Germans. Or Cheetah, who literally kidnap a guy and make him their emperor. The war bequeathed Japan a massive colonial empire, stretching from China to Indonesia. Now a world superpower, Japan is finding itself at odds with the United States and Germany. But the cracks are beginning to show. The government is increasingly divided between various factions, and corruption has run rampant. Not to mention, in the colonies, independence movements have begun to take root. The economy is in an equally precarious situation, with Japan extremely reliant on cheap material imports from their colonies. Basically, at the start of the game, Japan is a ticking economic time bomb. After being forced to cede Hawaii and the ports of LA and San Francisco to the Japanese, post-war politics were a mess. The 1948 presidential elections saw five different candidates carrying states and no single candidate won an outright majority. When the vote went to the House, Thomas Dewey defeated President Harry Truman, becoming the 34th President of the United States. Following the 1948 elections, support for the Democratic Party plummeted. Seen as the losers of the Second World War, their candidates were shunned at the polls. Facing increasing irrelevance and the real possibility of disillusion, in 1951, the Democrats approached the Republicans with an offer, merge the two parties. Together, they could form a coalition and bring much-needed stability to the nation. After a nationwide vote, the Republicans agreed by the narrowest of margins, and then the Republican Democratic Party, or the RDs, was formed. Of course, this was not the only new party in post-war America. Henry A. Wallace and Glenn Taylor had formed the National Progressive Front in 1947, and George S. Patton formed the Patriotic Party in 1951. Both managed to carry states in 1952, but the clear victor of the election was former General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Eisenhower managed to increase his majority in 1956, much to the target of the Patriotic Party and the National Progressive Front. As such, they decided on a merge. In 1957, the National Progressive Party formed. Vote NPP for segregation forever and overthrowing the bourgeoisie. We're also gonna fucking glass Tokyo. In the 1960 elections, fielded Strom Thurmond and Claude Pepper against the Re Republican Democrats. However, the RDs had an ace up their sleeve. President Eisenhower tore up the Akagi Accords, symbolically overseeing Hawaii's entry into the Union. President Richard Nixon and Vice President John F. Kennedy, yes, you heard that right. We're sworn in in 1961. Following the most one-sided vote in American history, it was clear that if the NPP wanted to become an equal to the RDs, something major would need to happen. To complicate things, in January 1962, the Hawaiian Missile Crisis is in full swing. Japanese missiles have been placed on Hawaii, threatening the west coast of the US. However, after tense negotiations between Vice President Kennedy and Japanese Prime Minister Eno, the conflict has diffused. So, what happens next? Well, the game starts in 1962. Go download it on the Steam Workshop to find out. Thanks for patrons Andy Luke, Emerson Salmeri Rubio, Link the Bets 24, Skylar Weston, Sean Fenerty Loins, and Zion.